Okay, so we don't, this is the uh, March 8th uh, bicycle pedestrian meeting um, of um, subcommittee of the Transportation and Parking Commission. We are recording this session. It's a hybrid format. So we have folks in my office and on Zoom. And we'll go ahead and start with a uh, public comment. Is anyone um, out there or in here for public comment? Mostly, mostly I just like to, mostly we're just here to observe, see what goes on. Okay. And, and see the topics. We do have some concerns. But okay. And we being? We we actually all uh, work together. Bob um, only for any bikes. Um, in, in Florence. Okay. Uh, and we work for him. Um, old disability rider that used to work for Valley Bike. I was thinking that's yeah. why you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so great. I saw, especially this agenda with, with the e bikes on, on trails uh -huh. and, and the Valley Bike, what's going on with them. We were interested in. in okay. Great. Where the committee is going with these things. Uh, okay. I have one question about the. And can you just state your name for the record? Bob, Bob Nolan. Okay. Great. Thanks. About the unquestionable um, situation of a valley bike that's been painted that is running around town and modified. Okay. Uh, Are you aware of that? Uh, no, I am not. Um, so there's one bike and one user that has is sort of off the system. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I can certainly let B. Wigan know because um, it's, you know, they had stated that they had collected all the bikes for the winter. And um, so if they are, um, they may not be aware that there's still a bike yeah. out there. Okay. Well, this one's significantly modified. Okay. And it's been painted different colors so it doesn't look like a valley bike, but it actually is. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, okay, any other public comments? Um, Nick? I, I, I can hold it off. I have a response to that. I have reported that bike to um, the Valley Bike contact information. Um, it's heavily modified. It goes at very high speeds. Um, um, but again, I did report that back in the fall. So just so you know, it has been, they've been okay. alerted to. Great, thank you. Um, Jim, did you have your hand up? I did. I just wanted to say hello, and I'm just here to listen in and hear the work you guys are up to. And and also, Carolyn, thank you for holding a meeting at 9 rather than 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'll thanks, turn Jim. my video off and everything. Okay, great. Um, all right. Seeing no other raised hands. Um, the first um, item on the agenda, I believe, is a discussion about um, electric bikes on the bike path. I know that, um, uh, Freeman, you had brought that to my attention as an item that you wanted to discuss, so that's why I put it on the agenda. So I don't know if you want to start out and um, describe sort of what you were thinking with that. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, and for me the question is, you know, what's the what's the 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 regulation going to be for for electric bikes on the bike path? Because um, I see a fair amount of them, as I've mentioned before. You know, I'm I live right on the trail in Florence, and I overlook the trail. So when I'm in the kitchen window, I see traffic going by, and I'm walking on it or riding on it frequently. And there are quite a number of electric bikes. And, um, you know, I remember, in fact, just the other day, I saw again, the very um, painted over sign about uh, no motorized uh, bikes allowed on the trail in Florence. I saw that sign. And I'm just wondering now that, that most of those motorized bikes are not, um, you know, uh, um, gasoline powered, uh, but electric powered. I'm wondering, you know, are there regulations? Uh, are what's happening with speed? Because some of those bikes are moving at a very high rate of speed, um, which is significantly different 
so I, that's I was just wondering what the status is and expressing some concern about about that. Okay, um, you know, I can answer the question that um, I know that the police department has also received some um, um, inquiries about the use of electric scooters and skateboards on the bike path. The electric, um, there is an ordinance in the city that allows for um, use of sort of electric assist or pedal assist electric vehicles. So the, the no motorized vehicles is really about um, automobiles. I mean, you know, four wheel heavy <laughs> um, automobiles. And we tried to craft a regulation that would allow, um, you know, um, electric assi assist bicycles on the bike path because, um, you know, it's a transportation corridor. Um, there, uh, of course, there are there is an increased use in all types of those sort of um, smaller or micro mobility modes um, throughout the city, and I think that will grow even further. So, in speaking with the police chief, we've discussed the um, you know the concerns, but also um, the benefits that these vehicles provide to expand opportunities for people to get from one place to another. Um, and um, so at this point, um, you know, I think the regulation is based on weight and speed, but I can pull that text up um, if that's helpful. Um, but at this point, I know the police department is not going to be doing enforcement um, of those sort of micro mobility modes um, uh, on the bike path. Nick, uh, yeah, I, I guess I I think it's reasonable to to not be thinking about enforcement um, based on the device, but there are speed limit restrictions, I believe, in that um, are there not? And I think that's an area where. Um, I forget again. Again, please correct me if I'm wrong. As we, I mean, we may want to come back to this, but I do yeah. believe that what those there is a limit on speeds on those, and certainly if there are vehicles exceeding those speed limits, I would want the police to be enforcing those. But again, that may be a. I but I, again, I'm pretty confident that there's some for what was approved has a speed cap on it. Yeah, and I'm sorry I didn't look that up before the meeting. I think it's anywhere between 12 and 17 miles per hour. Um, but the again, it comes down to how you know the ability for the police department to be right there at the moment that the vehicle goes above 17 miles per hour, and is it consistently above that? So it's it. I'm not suggesting that that you know that the city just throw up his hands and say we can't do anything about it, but I think that it's it's a little bit um more difficult to track since it's not necessarily consistently an issue it also relates to you know and that speed was sort of determined based on potential weight of the bicycle sort of thinking about the valley bike um e-assist bike as the as the model and that's a really heavy bike so um you know um road cyclists on a lighter bike are going much faster than that on the bike path sometimes so um that has a that's a different variable you know if you've got a you know a 10 pound bike going 30 miles an hour versus a 75 pound bike going 13 miles an hour so that's the kind of um that, that's where we got to those speed limits is sort of using that electric, the e-assist valley bike as sort of the model um, and bring those speeds down, so. Any other comments? Yeah, go ahead. I see some real challenges um, with, with the speed on the bike path. And um, I un certainly understand that it's going to be very difficult for the police to um police it yet um you know could there be something done with more signage um and 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 just making people aware that they're being watched for this um and i i 
I mean, I yell at people. Uh, the bike path goes through our parking lot, and I, I'm in the electric bike business, and I yell at these yahoos that are going down the bike path, not pedaling, and at 25, 30 miles an hour. Um, but there is very little signage that will would would kind of set the uh, tone for what you'd like to have happening and not have happening on the bike path. Yeah. I mean, signage is a problem in that it doesn't really stop people from speeding. And we know that from the streets. Right. Um, and um, the other, of course, problem is how many access points there are to the bike path. Sure. And, um, you know, if we had to sign every single access point, um, I'm not sure it would be um, as effective as we would like it to be. And then we'd end up with um, right. all sorts of space that can be tagged. And um, then um, we have to deal with sort of- Yeah, it's, it's just a thought. Everywhere. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, I let's, for example, I don't know how many people are familiar with the street in front of Williston that um, I don't even know the name of the street, but they have all kinds of caution lights and flashing things that say this is your speed and so on and i do think it helps slow people down but yeah. um it it's i would hate to see um a, a problem where e-bikes really get totally restricted because you know the old saying of don't throw the baby out with the bathwater i can see that kind of possibility and electric bikes have been just enormously helpful for so many people. And yet there are the yahoos out there that are giving it a, a, a bad name. And I think that's some of what we're hearing here this morning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, so, sort of, I think it's something to be aware of. I'm not sure that we, um, that there's any straightforward solution. And there are many other sort of types of, um, vehicles for lack of a better word that right. are being introduced that have that electric component so um i think um it's something that we can discuss with the police department more um as it goes forward but you know i think it's going to be um i think a lot of it is also the more people on the bike path may have some self-regulating effect because the more people there are, you know, you can't necessarily go as fast. Um, so the density sometimes. Um, but those people them. need those people need a um, something to back them up. If it's going to be kind of self policed, and yeah. I, I'm not so sure that we really have much for rules and regulations. Yeah, I mean, we do have the allowance for EOSIS bikes with a maximum mm -hmm. speed limit based on the weight. So, um, can we hear from Elena? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, super interesting conversation. I, I own an e-bike myself. Um, I, I use it as a car replacement um, and I ride it on the bike trail. Um, and I think, I, I'm, and I, I would say I'm hyper cautious and aware um, because I don't wanna be one of those yahoos who gets yelled at and bring a bad name to e-bikes because I, I really do see them as a super valuable tool in displacing car trips. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm, I slow down quite a bit um, when I'm passing people, both who are walking and on their bikes. Um, there is a governor on e-bikes and I don't know exactly what the speed is. Um, and then I would say, um, I think this is an opportunity for an education campaign. And I think there's an opportunity for Friends of Northampton Trails to step in and maybe even partner um, with the gentlemen who are in the room um, to do that education campaign. Um, I've been yelled at on the bike path when I'm riding my e-bike um, that I'm not allowed to be there. Um, you know that it's you know all of those things, and so I think um, there's a real opportunity to bring the community on board because this is an a new technology, I guess, or it's becoming more popular. Um, and so anything that we can do to, I, I, I don't wanna say get ahead of it because we're already behind, but 
um, move a little bit more quickly around, um, you know, letting people know what the rules of the trail or the road are. Um, and then talking to the e-bike riders, you know, letting them know, you know, it's it's maybe not a rule or regulation, but it's courteous to, to slow down. Um, you know, it's courteous to ring your bell. I think a lot of people, because the e-bikes are oftentimes really quiet, um, are startled by them when they pass. And so just, you know, doing some sort of education campaign around trail use and common courtesy. And I think that goes for everyone on the trail. Um, it could be a good, um, you know, springtime campaign that we could engage the community on. Thanks, Elena. Um, any other comments in that regard? Um, I, I, oh, go ahead, Brett. Uh, I was just going to briefly say that I appreciate Elena's remarks, particularly. I think it's the refrain that I've heard many times in this uh, forum is education is needed, which is a difficult thing to implement, but um, is probably the most important thing that advocates can do is to educate what the current rules are and then people then can speak up about what changes they think should be made. Um, I, I'm curious about that sign. I, I'm wondering that, that, that was mentioned at the top of this article. Um, is it still appropriate for that sign to be there? Is it useful? I wonder if we should remove that sign. I don't think it's doing any good personally. And I think it's just creating confusion as Elena may have mentioned. I think I'm set for now. Go ahead, Freeman. Well, not, not, on, not only is the sign you know, questionable in terms of its, you know, how it applies to the current situation with electric bikes, but it's also, <laughs> obscured by by lots of uh, painting over it. Um, so I think that probably is a good idea. Um, uh, and I just wanted to say that I'm I, I didn't bring the issue up because I'm opposed to <clears throat> e-bikes because I see all the benefits and and I think that Elena is right. Just like so many other things, as Brett mentioned, education really is the issue. I mean, we're in transition around so many things in society. But I, but I agree. I do think it's something that that FNT and other organizations can do a better job of just kind of repeating the messages, clarifying appropriate behavior, um, and sharing it. And that unsatisfactorily, though that may be, that may be the the best that we can do at at this point in time. Um, with regard to signage, you know, it's not only do we have questions about how effective it is or some information that it's not particularly effective, but you know, um, improving the consistency of signage on the trail and, and having, you know, that, that would be a really beneficial, I think, uh, to have uh, at some point. I'd love to see that. And that's something that we have at, discussed at FNT. There's a group of people who are interested in working on that as well. Um, and of course, the other thing that I would say is that, you know, when weather gets better, sometimes, you know, these cycling clubs have groups of, of cyclists who are on who are also moving at a pretty high rate of speed as well and not always appropriate. So I, I don't think it's exclusively a problem for e-bikes. And, and it just brings up what I think Elena was also referencing that, you know, just that general education for all users, the ringing of bells and all of that would be be appropriate. Um, so, you know, we'll certainly discuss it at FNT, but I, I, the main reason for bringing it up was just to, you know, to see if there are, if there are problems being reported, if there is a problem, or if it's just something that we need to spend more time educating the public about. Thanks for putting it on the agenda, Carolyn. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Okay, great. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, why not a hard um, speed limit posted? Hard speed limit. Um, although there are many access points, as you say, 
if we choose a few um, prominent ones, especially before a long stretch where there are no crossings, people will pass by it. Um, obviously, a lot of people ignore it, but they then cannot use the excuse, I didn't know. Um, I, I think that the people that are real, the real problem, they, they're, they're, they need um, solid, uh, what would you call it? Uh, Line of sand? Rules. <laughs> I mean, they need, you know, uh, again, they may step over them, but if they don't have that at all, they're just going to do what they want to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's more of a question of um, getting data from, like, the police department about how effective that would really be. I mean, personally, I feel that the people who really don't care don't aren't going to care about a sign. Anyway. No, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Non-e-cyclists mm -hmm. are still happy. Uh, and I am one. Correct. I'm um, certainly capable of going much faster than e-bike yeah. at times. Um, and I would hope that they're not using the bike path with groups. I, I, I haven't seen it. Um, that, that would be a concern uh, that they, they shouldn't be out. They shouldn't be on a bike path for that sort of activity. Um, so, but again, uh, if we if we set a limit, um, I, I don't know what would be a good speed limit, fifteen to twenty somewhere in there. Uh, those people hopefully would be more responsible. To say, okay, we we want to ride faster than that, and now I've got a, I've got an, an indication that I shouldn't go faster than eighteen, and our our little group of three or four, you know, we're capable of twenty five. So well, let's get to the road. Uh, might help get some people uh, off the trail. Yeah. Carolyn, I might be interested in sponsoring one of those um, speed indicators, small lights that light up and say your speed is. Uh -huh. um, if you want to get me some information on that, if the city's interested in that, I would be interested in sponsoring that. Yeah, I think it's probably a little premature to jump to a, an answer without really having more data and also potentially looking at some of the more congested bike paths in the eastern part of the state to see what how they're handling the situation. Um, and I would just I think that it, it probably makes more sense to do a little bit more background before we um, think about um defining the problem and defining solutions mm -hmm. okay so, um i don't uh, let's see nick did you have a comment um, about yeah that? thanks carolyn i just want to thank uh this is, i think it's been a really useful conversation that as you suggest gives us some idea about next steps. I just wanted to reiterate Elena's point about the car replacement part here because that is we're thinking about both on-road and off-road parts and making these things work. And I think that's been a really valuable point for me. Um, I think we do need more data. And my one question, which maybe will be for follow-up later on is, our existing counters do not do speed. Is that correct? Um, but we do have some counters that are available within the city. That again, maybe as we think about what additional data might help inform future conversations, um, maybe something to think about. You don't need to answer that right now, but I just wanted to kind of raise that. Thanks. Um, Elena. Just a quick comment on, I think it's been raised a couple of times around congestion on the trail, and that just points to the need to have safe infrastructure on street and a network to get people around the city with on-street infrastructure to relieve some of the congestion on the trail. So just wanted to raise that as um, a trend that I saw in a number of comments and um, you, know, cons you know consistently wanting to to increase that on-street infrastructure that's that's safe for all road users. Thanks. Brett. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, Elena hits the nail on the head again um, with, you know, on it's a part of a bigger puzzle. I'd like to try to keep this conversation to on the trails because I think that's what um, the initial focus was. Obviously, it is part of a bigger picture that we do need to keep working on, educating and improving. Um, as regards to a 
hard speed cap. Carolyn, can you speak to what more data you would want to see other than what other organizations and other uh, municipalities have done? I guess some, my, my, the reason for my question is that I, I, while I like to be data driven, I also don't want to wait for there to be data on the exact thing that we have, on the exact situation that we have, because it's never going to happen that it's exactly the same. So I'm not afraid to speak up and ask for a speed limit if we think that's appropriate. Um, you know, we, we would want to talk a lot more about it before we make that recommendation, but I would at least consider it. And I'm curious what data you would want to see in order to consider it. Um, yeah, I mean, I use that term sort of broadly that I want, I would like more information about what other communities are, um, have addressed this and how they've addressed this also the different types of vehicles and what the ramifications would be for slower speeds versus higher speeds and in just that ratio of weight to speed and what might make sense for sort of what's the overall, what are, um, what are the trends for those, those weights of bike and what's really more, I mean, what, at what speed is it um, harder to stop and therefore more dangerous, you know, as obstacles might come across um, or uh, people and other users of a bike path might um, create in terms of obstacles. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we go out and do a lot of research. I just think we need to collect information about um, different vehicles, weights, speeds, what other communities have done, in, at, at least. And maybe there are other things that we want to get information about. So. Um, okay, so clearly to be continued, <laughs> um, looks like education and more data information gathering. And thank you, Freeman, for um, asking for that item to be sort of put on as a topic for conversation. Um, let me just quickly sneak a peek. Um, Okay, so there are basically two other things on the agenda. One is re related to, I raised it up, um, Freeman also um, suggested that he wanted to have a conversation about tagging. And um, I'm, again, do you want to elaborate a bit more on um, your interest in having this as a discussion item? Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, We've been aware, FNT has been aware, as I'm sure anybody who uses the trail regularly is aware that that there's been a fair amount of of painting and and tagging uh, different places along the trail, including on signs. Um, uh, but the main reason for bringing it up was that uh, I was invited to attend a meeting at the at City Hall along with a number of other people by. Um, Kevin McAllister and I think Amy Cahillane from the DNA, <clears throat> because Kevin has proposed an initiative to paint over graffiti and, and he's pulled together people. And, and I'm imagining, Carolyn, you probably can say more about this. I know Tom Anise was, Anise was there at the meeting. Um, and just trying to understand what people's perspectives are about this, because um, <clears throat> Well, it's it's uh, irritating to me to to see painting on places where I personally would prefer not to see any. The idea of just painting over graffiti um, seems not to be the you know the the primary focus that we should have. Um, and I just wanted to hear more thoughts about it um, rather than just to advocate for one particular perspective. You know, one of the things that FNT has been working on is this kind of art on the trail and, and just kind of getting art into the neighborhoods. And one of the things that seems to be true to me, and I think is validated by others, is that um, art that has been placed not only on the trail, but in other places around town tends not to be painted over or tagged. I mean, there is some, but for the most part, um, 
things that that have kind of aesthetic appeal don't seem to be you know treated that way um on the other hand if you go on the rail trail for example uh behind king street um behind foster farrar and buildings over there you see a lot of tagging uh i'm not sure that the tagging offends me more than the mess behind those built businesses um you know and i i wonder about you know uh, uh, kind of an aesthetic committee to kind of address respecting, you know, it's not public art, but public spaces um, might be just as a, another component of this. So I'm interested in hearing what other people think about it, because um, it's something that FNT and and I know George Kohok, the the president of FNT, is is interested in addressing, and I know that members of of FNT have have expressed concern to him about this so that's why i bring it up i mean as you mentioned the city i think is a broader conversation not really a bike pedestrian um, specific conversation um so i think that's why it's sort of a, um, the conversation has started at the at the uh, mayor's um sort of level and with um, volunteers to sort of think about what or how or if um, the tagging concerns can be addressed. Um, and I don't really have any more details than that where, I mean, um, Tom has done a lot of remove from our office has done removal on, you know, boxes downtown and things that really, you know, are meant to be there for, the public to be able to see and enjoy. And so um, tagging certain items has become sort of, um, a, uh, had an impact on the um, the use or the functionality of whatever that item is. So we've been trying to address that. Um, other than that, I don't, you know, I don't know if there's anything, any place for this committee necessarily to to weigh in in particular, unless they want to be involved, unless the members might want to be involved in that sort of larger citywide effort that goes beyond just bike path. Any other comments on that? I would just briefly say that I think that I'm more interested in the broader um, aesthetics question than the specific tagging question, but I don't have a lot to say on it. You mean cleaning up um, behind businesses that about the other path? Right. So, so that and, you know, litter and, you know, some more education and, you know, et cetera, around all areas of aesthetics, um, the ones that Freeman mentioned and others. Um, but, and I, I think that could be in our purview, but only tangentially. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda, the last item really, other than minutes, is um, I just wanted to bring the committee up to speed on where we are with uh, Valley Bike. Um, they had experiment Valley Bike, who um, also runs the operations and sort of bike balancing, bike maintenance for the whole system um, in the Pioneer Valley. Uh, had experimented with wintertime usage, as you all know, um, last year. And this year, they determined that um, the cost, um, sort of cost benefit of running the winter system was too high for them. The costs were too high. And so they, they pulled all the bikes in, except for this one lone bike that apparently <laughs> was able to be um, effectively stolen from the system. <laughs> um, so um, in the intervening months, they said they were sort of gonna try to regroup and um, 
figure out a plan for sponsorship. They've been working on trying to get more advertising to offset the costs that they incur for balancing the bikes. Um, and so we're at a point now where they have made it known to us that the current situation whereby the communities essentially pay nothing. We just get grants to buy more bikes, to create more stations, but we don't, this communities don't really pay in for any operational costs. And the trade-off for that was that B. Wigan was going to be the entity that would obtain sponsorships and use the fare box revenues to offset those costs for um, maintaining the bikes and balancing the bikes and repairing the bikes um, and running the IT back office systems. Uh, that hasn't panned out. They have not been able to get large sponsors or continue or con um, continuously have sponsorship. So they let us know at the end of January that they wanted to um, seek, um, they want to renegotiate contracts with us and have the communities start paying for operations and paying the cost. Um, we internally with the consortium, so there are nine communities in UMass, uh, or sorry, eight communities in UMass that are part of the Valley Bike Share. Um, we've been since the end of January um, trying to think about ways that we could um, work with Be Wegan to help them obtain sponsorships. Um, we didn't come up with any specific plan, um, but then we were just last week notified by B. Wegan that um, they are starting procedures in Canada for um, towards um, filing some um, mechanism in bankruptcy court in Canada in order to restructure all of their contracts. So effectively, they want to immediately eliminate the contract we have with them that provides uh, free maintenance and bike balancing, which means that um, the communities would have to come up with the cost for operations immediately in order to restart bike share in April, which the current contract um, requires them to reopen in April. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know where we are. It does not appear that we can come up with a million dollars by the end of March from the nine communities, including UMass. Um, and so we're right now sort of trying to figure out that piece. So Valley Bike will not likely start up operations again in April, but we don't know when that will happen and which communities want to continue under a new structure where the communities pay and potentially then the communities are able to get more sponsorship to offset those costs offset the community's costs for paying for operations. That's all I've got. One <laughs> quick clarifying question. Yeah. The $1 million that you mentioned, that covers what? One year of, or, or April to November of operating costs? Is that the estimate? Actually, the I'm not sure. I get, I've been getting different numbers, so they want to break it down to between an IT cost and an operational co operational cost. So they're still interested in running the IT piece of it, and they're saying that it'll be about two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year for the back office IT support um, for the entire system, and then it would be. They don't know but they're just throwing out a hard number of $1,500 per bike per year for operations. Um, and so um, we don't know if that's their operations or if we can, you know, the whole idea is we could potentially create or help facilitate an entity locally to run operations. Um, and that might be a lower cost. Maybe this, maybe the system shrinks because some communities don't want to participate anymore because they were getting free bikes and they don't want to pay for bikes. Um, we don't know. So um, we've reached out to a couple of, to one um, 
so the idea is sort of we're sort of looking at all um, ways to potentially address this. One is sort of trying to think of locally if there would be some entity that would want to step in and start running an operational component, um, but still have a connection to that IT component if, um, that they provide. Um, so that bike, that operational cost may be different. It may not be as high, or maybe it's going to be higher. We just we just don't know. Quick question. Yep. What is the IT component that you're talking about? What what is that? What is that? Um, so is that the app. It's the app. It's the web interface. It's the um, it's the dashboard. The data collection of um, um, trip generation, origins and destinations, length of time. Okay. Um, it's the membership interface or the pay payment um, connection um, and that that piece of it basically so and that include customer service yes so they would provide the personnel and so forth right for customer service and this by the way just so you know um, is they're doing this they're restructuring this with all of their bike share um, cities around the country and in Europe. Um, there are a couple of, I guess their Richmond operation already functions this way where they're paying or Richmond is paying for operations. And so they want to move all of their systems to that um, model. In response to Brett's question about the million dollars, that would be one year of operations, right. roughly. Uh, fifteen hundred. You said fifteen hundred per bike. That's well, they initially six, said it was about nine hundred dollars per bike per year for everything, and then more recently, I've gotten different numbers that are higher. So I, I just, it's hard to know what that is. Yeah. One, one more than a million dollars. Is that just the nine stations that you guys have up here, or is that the entire no, valley? The entire system. Okay. So seven hundred sixty bikes, except maybe it's seven hundred fifty nine. <laughs> Um, and um, a, a 78 stations right now. Yeah. So. Elena? I have a question. Um, so I, and I'm not familiar with bike share business structures, um, but I know like in Boston, it's blue bikes and that's a sponsorship model. And I know there's a municipality component to it as well. But I also think like Lyft owns it. Um, and so I'm just wondering if the city also looked into like a buyout by one of the larger transportation companies like Lyft um, to own. And I know in like Chicago, Lyft owns all of their um, bike share. Um, so I, I don't know if that has been explored. Um, so we just were received, started receiving this notice trickling in at the end of January. No, we haven't been tapping on Lyft's shoulder to see if they want to buy out. Um, you know, that's not the way bike, I mean, bike share has evolved over time, right? So initially, you know, um, Chicago started with a different system. Lyft was not the owner or operator, but they also had sponsorships. So that covered the cost. We understand that Lyft also apparently owned um, the system in Minneapolis and couldn't make, um, and the sponsorship left. And so Lyft has left. Um, so it's really, um, and then in New York, it's um, City Bike is sponsored by Citibank. So for the most part, we think these systems work from sponsorships um, primarily because of course the ridership isn't gonna cover the cost just like bus transit, you know, ridership never costs, it covers the cost of operations. Um, so I don't, I think it doesn't, we sort of assumed that B. Wegan was looking for a big buyout or some support at some point, but we have no idea because we don't know what their internal thinking is about all of this. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to your question. I assumed that, um, they may have been, they're sort of looking at the competition out there and, and trying to figure out how they can survive in the, mar in the market. 
Um, and, you know, but no, I guess the short answer is we haven't gone to any of sort of the bigger operators to ask if they want to step in. But the same, I think the same thing would apply. Like they're not going to do it for free. It's going to, we're going to need some kind of coverage for that funding if it's just coming from the cities or for some corporate, from some corporate entity. Yeah, so if anybody, totally anybody knows of any big philanthropic donor who wants to throw money at this regularly, or for that matter, anybody at a big um, MGM or Mass Mutual or one of those, um, send the contacts our way. <laughs> yeah, I agree that Lyft isn't ideal, but I was just curious. Um, and I guess a follow-up question is the money that's coming out. Um, this might be like too too delayed, but there's been a lot of movement at the state level with Mara Healy's budget and the dollars she's allocating to municipalities, namely around transportation. So I don't know what the timing is of that and whether or not there's a pool of money or a portion of money that could be brought in from that. Yeah, I mean, basically, where's the other strategy is sort of think more strategically working with um, and with PVTA to sort of tap into that as sort of a transportation um, system um, that's integrated. But, you know, it means um, regular sort of annual um, allocation for that service. It's not just a one-off um, payment. So. Um, if there are no other comments about that, um, so we'll, we'll keep you posted. Obviously, we're working diligently to try to save the system. Um, but if there are no other comments, the only other thing I have are the two sets of minutes from January and February. I had a comment. I'm sorry. I should have said it during public comment. Is that okay if I say it now? I can wait till after the minutes. Sure, that's fine. I just had a quick question on um, Main Street and the 25% design and if there's been any update from the state on that. Um, no. <laughs> they, we, um, at the beginning of February, they were making moves to potentially, to advertise and have an end of March public hearing. We haven't heard anything. So I, I don't know, sorry. Okay, Nick. I move we approve the minutes from the January 11th and February 15th uh, meetings. Is there a second? I second. Okay, um, so I'm gonna have to do a roll call since we're hybrid. Um, Freeman? Yes. Nick? Yes. And Brett? Yes. Okay, and I vote yes, so that's unanimous. And that's all I have. Does anybody have anything else? Okay. No, these are great conversations and I look forward to continuing them. Um, uh, Carolyn, for future agenda items, I'd love if we could talk about the bike shelter. Um, and, and I don't know if it's any feasibility of Cracker Barrel Alley as a place for that, but I realize there's also some loose ends there um, about um, the funding for the bike shelter. So um, sure, I can put that just an update. I mean, the, we had a discussion about it at the last meeting and um, honed in on Pulaski Park. Cracker Barrel, Barrel Alley is, you know, at a steep, pretty steep grade. So it would be hard to put a shelter in there. Um, but um, we're going to move ahead on sort of looking at final design and shelter for um, one uh, across from the bus shelter um, location in Pulaski Park or right next to the bus shelter, I should say. So great. Thank you all. And we'll see you next time.